What's up, world? I'm Matt Newberg from Hungary, and this is The Feed. Each episode, we'll dive into conversations with the industry insiders who are leveraging technology to shape the way we eat. On today's episode of The Feed, I sat down with Carlos Ventura Jr., founder and CEO of Feast and Fettle, a regional meal prep service delivering throughout Rhode Island and Massachusetts. In this episode, we'll talk about how the service has scaled from a home chef operation to over 20 million in revenue, how it's differentiated from other food delivery services, and its brand new retail strategy. Carlos, it's awesome to have you on the podcast today. I'd love for you to just talk about your background from iBanking to working at Deliveroo and founding Feast and Fettle. Um, what was the opportunity that you saw in 2018 and like how did your past experiences you know help inform that yeah yeah um first of all thanks for having me really appreciate it uh strong follower of your content uh you seem to do all of the real due diligence in the space so thank you for doing that um you know my background um into food or food tech started uh when i was at goldman really started to cover and look at all of the kind of up and coming players in the in the food delivery space, primarily in Europe um, and Asia at the time. So these were, you know, the delivery heroes, the Just Eats, um, the Deliveroo's, um, uh, HelloFresh, all, all those players that are kind of based out in uh, Europe. And, you know, one thing I noticed was the ridiculous amount of growth and the ridiculous amount of capital being raised simultaneously. Um, you know, and once you started to kind of peel back um, the numbers, it it was you know clearly a challenge in terms of um, profitability. And uh, at the time, I guess that wasn't necessarily the focus, right? The focus was all growth, raise capital, get market share. Um, so I I really started to kind of understand the different intricacies of the different models, and um, kind of naturally ended up. Uh, getting connected to the folks at Deliveroo, um, moved over to Deliveroo, and that was really um, kind of an eye-opening experience. You know, when you're a banker and you're working, you know, from the outside in, it's, it's much, much different than, you know, being there from a day-to-day perspective and seeing how the operations of these businesses work. Um, so for me, I actually joined um, as, part of the, as part of the Corp Dev team, um, helped them raise, I think it was like the Series D at the time, and uh, eventually transitioned into leading competitive intelligence, which was uh, also eye-opening, right? Like, so you're looking at all of the different models, whether that's, you know, marketplace, logistics. Um, Deliveroo was one of the companies that pioneered this notion of ghost kitchens. And actually, that was so, that's what sold me on moving to the company in the first place. And the reason is because once you start to get more or you start to capture more of that uh, that stack, the customer stack, and you become more vertically integrated, there's more opportunity to become profitable. There's more, um, or there's less of the pie to share. So um, I was at Deliveroo for, I want to say, a couple of years. Um, fascinating experience, but I always kind of had that itch to go out um, and do it on my own. I also, um, you know, loved my experience there, um, but I also wasn't necessarily a fan of kind of continuing to you know, push to raise that next massive round of capital <laughs> and kind of repeat the process. It kind of felt like a never ending cycle. Um, so I, uh, I actually had no plans whatsoever to stay in the food space. I um, was a little turned off by just what was happening in the, in the industry as a whole. And uh, one of my very close friends uh, gave me a ring and said, hey, you know, I I've been doing this for a couple of years with my friend. We, you know, we're operating out of an incubator kitchen here in Rhode Island. I heard you were moving back. Um, you know, what are you interested in helping us kind of scale this? And um, I knew the name of the business. It was Feast and Fettel. Um, my friend Maggie had uh, graduated Johnson and Wales, a university here in Rhode Island, and she didn't really set out to start a meal delivery business. She actually was a private chef and a nanny. And people just wanted more and more of her food. So she said, hey, let me, you know, hire my best friend, Nikki, and go move into this incubator kitchen and get a delivery van to make sure I can service more customers. So it was a little, you know, the, the reasoning behind the delivery was different. So when I, uh, when I moved back, I go to the incubator kitchen and I just, I was fascinated at the level of quality. I mean, it was, um, 
very fine-tuned, very detailed, uh, whether that was a customer service or just how the food was presented, I was so fascinated with what they were doing at a very small scale. And um, I think it was like, some, someone quoted this as one of the VCs basically said like scale things that aren't scalable. And that immediately <laughs> kind of like, yeah, immediately came to my mind. And I was like, oh, this is not scalable at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was when uh, I said, let's, 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 let's do this. Um, so that was 2018. We had about 25 customers. Mm-hmm. Um, servicing a small part of Rhode Island, and uh, yeah, we've think a lot of things have changed since then. Amazing, love the story, and I remember those days at Deliveroo um, when you had those addition kitchens. I, you know, it's kind of like the early reef model, I guess, is the closest analog I could say. It's like you had those shipping containers that were parked underneath these. Um, bridges and these urban industrial areas where, you know, you had deliver delivery couriers ferrying food, you know, off of these things and um, restaurateurs were essentially uh, given a little space inside of these uh, shipping containers. I think you guys, like, like you said, were one of the first marketplaces to get further upstream. So it's fascinating. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and like you know, I guess like the opportunities and challenges, but mostly the challenges you saw with that model at Deliveroo and then kind of how that informed what you're now doing with Feast and Fettel. Yeah, so I I think one of the challenges was fundamentally running, it, it's a different business, right? I mean, you're kind of like teetering on the fence of, are, are you a real estate business? Are you starting to acquire, you know, these plots of land or lease them or buy them? and Um, you know, you're trying to kind of retrofit, um, an existing business that necessarily isn't kind of optimized for a delivery only model. So there was a lot of like friction when it came to kind of the convergence of the marketplace and the, the additions of the, the ghost kitchen model, um, natural friction, but friction. Um, you know, the other thing that I did notice was when we did things like we would launch these delivery only brands that had no physical presence whatsoever. Um, you know, there was this one um, Indian food brand that we launched in Canary Wharf and it quickly became, you know, one of our fastest growing brands and it had no physical retail location. And outside of the branding and all of the design, it was beautiful, it was gorgeous and it was optimized for delivery, but so was the menu. So the menu was optimized for delivery in the sense that, you know, we weren't going to put anything on that menu that would potentially, let's just say, get soggy in, you know, in a 30 minute delivery, right? Like those little things matter. And when we started to kind of, again, you're, it's that same kind of premise of owning more of the, the customer experience where you can start to optimize the experience for delivery where we saw success. So challenges were, you know, probably what you heard, what you would, what you would expect. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the good thing was we were capturing more of the margin when we were, um, you know, owning more of the the customer. And then now looking at your current role as CEO of Feast and Fettel and doing this whole meal solutions and kind of closed loop delivery, what are some of the you know biggest lessons that you've learned from that experience, that prior experience at delivery that you've now like really started to hone in here at Feast and Fettel? I think there's there's two kind of big ones. One of them is that vertical integration point. We you know we do everything from prep to cook to deliver. We own customer service. We have no contractors. Um, we essentially have all employees, and, and and we're essentially establishing, you know, a brand. I think that's that's very very important when you're talking about not sharing the margins with anyone, right? Like you have full control over the P and L. Um, so that's, that's one piece. And I think that also needs to be coupled with knowing exactly who your customer is. Like the reality is right. Like everybody, let's just say in a futuristic world, everybody wants, you know, maximum convenience. And part of that convenience, you know, equates to a delivery model, you know, someone that's, you know, and let's just say a, a college graduate student versus, you know, an affluent family that's well-established there should not, you know, the, the same business should not service both, both of those customers, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that this is a winner takes all type of business when it comes to, you know, market segmentation and catering a brand and a service and a product for a particular market. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of the, I'd say, symptoms of uh, VC and tech 
kind of overshadowing the notion of food, right. which is, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you, if the, if the tech could be phenomenal, but if the food sucks, <laughs> it does not matter. Yeah. So, you know, you need to ensure, you know, who <laughs> serving. I'm willing to put up with bad tech for the record. I'm willing to put up with bad tech for good food, and I've done it plenty of times. Restaurant reservations in foreign countries, <laughs> even in this country, like, I'm willing to put up with poor user experience for good offline experience because that's ultimately what matters most. <laughs> you know, it's 100% true, and it's actually, when I, when I first looked at Feast and Fettle, we had, like, 25 customers. We were taking in, the, the website was horrible. Like, no shame, that website was it was garbage. Um, but that was also, you know, a sign that, hey, look, what, these customers keep coming back and they're ordering off of the horrible website, which we print out the orders from, a, you know, from Gmail and we're like tallying things up manually. Right? Like that, that was actually the sign to me that we had something special and unique. And mm -hmm. that was what we wanted to scale. So when it comes to food, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, it's very good to have awesome technology because you're talking about, you know, UX and uh, customer call it optimization and whether it comes to the logistics you want to be tracking things like that's super important but product sucks the product sucks and the product is food yeah yeah you're just throwing good money after bad on customer acquisition at that point right no one's going to come back so i'd love for us to dive in now and, and talk about feast and fettle give us like kind of the the customer facing value proposition who your customers are how many cities any details you can share um on any kind of stats on the business um, just so people get a sense of what what you guys really are about yeah yeah I think it's kind of important to understand where we came from which is the bit you know the business was started again by a private chef um, so everything we do to this day is rooted in that original service that we provided those customers so when you see our taglines on our website you'll see like home cooks meal home cooked meals without the cooking because essentially we want to replicate that home cooked meal experience for families that they otherwise cannot enjoy because they're time constrained um, or maybe they, don't, they just simply don't want to cook. Um, but when it comes to Feast and Fettle, we're not trying to replace restaurants, right? Particularly our customer, we, we do have an affluent customer base and these customers are still going to go to the restaurants and they're still going to have the restaurant experience. What we want is to be able to be that consistent provider of high quality home cooked meals and almost and almost like the things you would cook if you had the time to right like we're not trying to get a little you know trying to get too exotic it's just what's familiar what's consistent and what can serve my entire family so some of the ways we kind of cater the product you'll notice we you know talk about family style so there's entrees and sides so you won't get this single serving um, kind of mash up um, that the company that the other meal delivery services kind of just send to you and it shows up on your door um, we ask our customers hey what entree do you want to pair with this side or what side do you want to pair with this entree and we you know we do a little education along the way but the whole notion is that one household with a vegan a pescatarian and a meat eater can happily enjoy dinner together and that was a challenge we were trying to solve when we had 30 customers and now we're over 6,500 customers and we're still you know, solving that same challenge. Um, we service right now, we service uh, all of Rhode Island, most of Massachusetts. We're um, kind of piloting right now in Fairfield County and um, Hartford Counties in Connecticut ahead of our second kitchen launch. Uh, so I don't know how many towns, probably a couple hundred towns um, between you know, the three states. Uh, but uh, yeah, we've been you know, expanding pretty quickly um, you know, surpassed the $20 million run rate, um, last year. Um, and we are not slowing down <laughs> in terms of growth, um, which is nice. Uh, but I think it really, it boils down to, you know, how it's, it's a level, it's a level of detail, um, and, and how we treat our customers. And we understand that the, the, the product is ultimately food and, um, it shows up in the retention numbers. Amazing. Congrats on all that, all the success so far. It's a, it's a really awesome story. Um, I'd love to, you know, like dissect a little bit more like the customer behavior of like where you guys fit in am am amongst this crazy landscape. But we have, obviously we've talked about DoorDash and just on-demand food delivery, right? Uber Eats, uh, other kind of ship to home 
meal solutions like uh, Freshly or even stuff you can get at the grocery store that are prepackaged that are heat and eat. Um, and then obviously the traditional beloved, beloved uh, restaurant experience of, you know, sitting at a table enjoying a meal with your loved ones. How does this fit into the daily, like the, the weekly bustle on, um, of a typical customer's, um, you know, consumption? Like how are they leveraging your service? Is this like their only source of sustenance throughout the week or are they just using it? You know, like what are the different kind of... Um, personas if you had to just at a high level break it down as far as like how people really like to use your service yeah we have a lot they say we have a few segments but i think the the, the primary segment is using feast and fettle three to four nights a week um to make sure that dinner is kind of checked off and and handled um without the worry of is anyone going to not like what we're going to eat and without the worry of um, you know that, I don't know what you want to call this. There should be a word for this, but when you either text or call someone in your family, mem someone in your household and you're like, what do you want for dinner? Like that is probably one of the worst like text messages to receive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because like, where Stop do we, everything for an hour, <laughs> where do we begin? And then once you kind of find a, finally land on something, it's like, you know, the foods, you know, it's not there on time. So because, you know, Feast and Fettle, you know, delivers the meals in bulk. So we're typically delivering two to three dinners for, you know, a household between two and four. And we're, we're making that in one shot. So because we own the, the delivery, um, we are, you know, our own delivery vans are going out there. The, the food is delivered in insulated bags. You're taking it in and you're essentially like, okay, I got dinner for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week, the other two days. Um, and we have different personas, but quite frankly, a lot of our customers do like to cook. They, they enjoy cooking for their family. It's just, you know, again, the time constraint. Um, we, you know, we have a lot of folks that do join the service and they're like, I've tried, you know, you know, name the name, right? Um, all the meat, regional and national players out there. And if it's a meal kit, it's not even like solving the solution. So I kind of like push those into their own category of not, not solving a real problem. Right. Too much prep too much prep, too much packaging, too much waste. Um, and when I think about what they really, what they really look for, it's just that, you know, consistent quality. So we do have a lot of folks that, you know, do use like the Uber Eats of the world. And they're like, Hey, I'm either, <laughs> this is a weird thing that we get, but folks often say, um, I feel so guilty ordering, uh, takeout for my family three or four nights a week. And so we're, we're nestling the brand between, hey, you don't have to feel guilty about this and, you know, it's prepared locally, it's fresh and you can reheat it and prepare it, serve it on your own, you know, dinnerware at home. So it's more of a, uh, I'd say a, a loving, caring experience with your loved ones versus like eating out of a, you know, a takeout container. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, I think the it's like all about the indulgence versus just like the the more functional but delicious wholesome food and being able to like, you know, have the ability to go out and splurge on a meal calorically and financially. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, you're just like working and you know, it's a long day and you just want something good for your family. Feel good about it. Exactly. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm looking at the price points, you know, the, of your various plans, and it seems like, you know, for this for the solo diner out there, um, obviously you don't have as many as much like uh, economies of scale. So it's it looks like it's somewhere between twenty and twenty five dollars a week for or sorry per meal for them, yeah. um, and then for for like a family of four, it comes out to about sixteen dollars a person per meal. So pretty reasonable if you look at you know, A, the quality of the food that you're getting, which we'll talk about, and then yeah. B, like, you know, what those other services charge you. I mean, getting uh, an entree with a couple sides um, on one of these marketplaces, I mean, you're going to be paying probably double or more that, you know, for the same experience, and it's probably going to be less healthy for you. So uh, are there any, uh, does that include delivery? And like, how does that kind of look to the consumer? Like, how do they choose those meals for their families? Like, if it's family style, how is the pescatarian working with the, the vegetarian um, and that sort of thing? And yeah, just walk us a little bit more through like, uh, what that looks like and kind of how the, the deliveries work. Yeah, yeah. So let, let me walk through an example of kind of ordering for, you know, a, a household that's probably on the more complicated side. Um, you're right about price points. Um, they range between, 
uh, $25 on the high side down to $15 once you're kind of up into the family plans. Um, but essentially, you sign up for a plan. You let us know, you know how many meals you want, what's your household size. And after that, we really try to strip out all of the decision fatigue. And what I mean by that is once you kind of choose your plan, you know, you just, you essentially just choose what you want to feed your family. So our most popular plan is three entrees and five sides. And we're going to charge you the same amount. This might sound crazy, but we're going to charge you the same amount, whether you get the beef tenderloin or whether you get, um, I don't know, the bugatini pasta, right? Like it, it doesn't necessarily, um, matter. And, and we don't want folks to necessarily kind of have to go again through more decision fatigue around dinner time. Um, when it comes to making their selection. So we, we charge a fixed price for a certain number of entrees and sides and we say, go ahead, you know, pick what works for your family. The unique thing about Feast and Fettel, um, and we've done this since day one and it got harder and harder as we scaled, as you can imagine, is um, really customizing um, down to the dish level. So for example, um, if you want the, you know, we have a baked CD with sausage, which is like a super popular dish here. If you want to remove the sausage and make it vegetarian, you know, we'll do that. If you don't like tomatoes or onions in your salad, we were kind of joking earlier this week, someone removed all of the ingredients from their salad and we just <laughs> delivered lettuce, which was like <laughs> pretty interesting. Um, but we'll, whatever, we'll let you do that. Um, so we, we offer all of these customizations and modifications um, to ensure that, you know, folks are able to enjoy the meals um, that fit their dietary preferences. Um, so because things are really entree and, entrees and side based, once you get it to your household, it's a, it's a matter of mix and, mix and matching depending on you know, what each um, household member wants. Delivery is, uh, so we, give you, we have the select program. So select includes free delivery, we give you 5% cash rewards. Um, so that's free unlimited delivery. Um, you know, bonus referrals, you get 150 bucks per referral. And long story short, um, that's 10 bucks a month. Uh, that's kind of like the subscription component of the business. And uh, yeah, it gives you kind of all those benefits, which is pretty, I mean, when you look at the 5% cash back, you know, folks can kind of make that back like pretty darn quick when it comes to 10 bucks a month. Um, and if you're not on that, if you're not on that plan, um, it's $5 per delivery. It doesn't cost us that much when you think about, you know, AOV, and um, you think about everything being pre-optimized on the delivery side. So logistics is something that, you know, it's, it's obviously still challenging, but I think folks are a little surprised when I kind of uh, communicate, like it's not as challenging as, uh, you know, the deliverers of the world, which is how do, we reduce, <laughs> how do we reduce this from, you know, 30 minutes to 29 minutes and 35 seconds, right? Like that was the challenge we were trying to solve there. <laughs> Um, totally make, makes a lot of sense uh, as far as like, you know, so it seems like the, the family style meals, like you just basically have to, at some point settle for something that's going to satisfy everyone because each, each of those nights is only one entree for the family of four. Right. And then the sides are, there's a couple sides that come with that. Right. It's not like everyone's getting their own individual meal. Right. You could hypothetically, you could create, you could customize a plan to make that work in that manner. But yeah. it's important to note, like our meals are, they're good for four days after delivery. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're they're made literally the the day before we deliver them, so they're chilled, they're never frozen. Um, they, again, they go out in insulated bags and refrigerated vans, and then delivered to your door with like a commercial grade ice pack. So it's really about, you know, you you can. I mean, some people. It's interesting how people use feast and fettle as well. You know, like some people will get, you know, the simpler entrees and the simpler sides and kind of like hack them at home and kind of make them their own. <laughs> um, some folks will actually like plan out, you know, every specific, you know, evening we're going to have this entree and these two sides and you're going to have that mm -hmm. entree and these two sides. Mm, um, interesting. So it's very like interesting how different people utilize the service, but you know, that's the flexibility inherently built in um, the product. Right. Just give them the building blocks and let them figure it out for themselves. Exactly. Um, we'd love to zoom in more on the culinary pr product itself and just talk a little bit about, you know, how, you, how you're sourcing your supply chain, what are the kind of standards when it comes to the ingredients, um, and, like, how do you see these various kind of... Um, 
you know, food preferences or quote unquote diets. You know, there's been a lot of these services that have really honed in on being able to filter by whole 30 or keto and all these labels. And a lot of the times you have to go and look up what they are to really understand them. And I don't know if even the people eating them understand them but you know like how much control how much filtering do you give people what are your thoughts on that and like kind of what's your general approach to sourcing and quality yeah so um again kind of going back to our roots you know we when we were super small maggie simply just went to whole foods with our customers credit cards and bought all of them. <laughs> right and you know luckily for us whole foods had you know very very strict um a very very long set of ingredients that they don't allow in in their you know facilities and um, we essentially use I would say it's not exactly the same but it's very very close we use Whole Foods um, you know exclusions list as our you know foundation of hey you know what is allowed or not allowed in our kitchen um, so the level of um, you know, I'd say the barriers to get into the Feast and Fettel from a sourcing perspective are quite rigid. And, you know, we use that list anytime we talk to any new supplier. So it's, it's primarily things you, you more or less like can't pronounce. Like, you know, if you look at our labels and you see anything on that label, you're going to know 99.9% .9 of every single thing on that ingredient list. And you're going to be able to pronounce them all. So we keep it very, very simple from that perspective. There's no preservatives. Um, there doesn't need to be preservatives. It's fresh food. Um, so our sourcing strategy is all predicated off of that. Now, when we think about like proximity of the location of the, co of the commissary and, you know, who we work with, um, we prioritize quality first and then proximity. Um, uh, that's simply just based off of what we know our members truly prioritize. Um, and we're also in New England, so, you know, you can't get corn all year round in New England, but we sometimes want to have corn on the menu outside of, you know, prime time season. Um, so, you know, when we look at, you know, sourcing in particular, we really like the folks that are close by. So we work with a company called Leaf Farms in southern New Hampshire. Um, they do all of our lettuce. We sell a lot of salad. Um, it's an indoor um, kind of vertical farming operation. Um, so, you know, they've been phenomenal because they've been able to scale you know, as we went from, you know, like 100 customers to now where we are today, um, maintaining that same exact quality. Um, and so when we look for, again, we look for supply side um, sourcing partners, it's all about quality, scale, and um, ensuring that, you know, it's, it's obviously economically feasible as well. Um, you asked me another question um, on the back half of that. What was that? I guess it was like looking at like the filters and the ways that which people define their diets, which I find to be very fascinating and very uh, yeah. constantly evolving. So like, what, what are your thoughts on this? What do you guys, what, what have you guys settled on when it comes to that customer facing filter and how people can basically see things that are right for them and personalize it to their needs? Yeah, so that's, it's, this is such an interesting topic um, because it, it evolves not only you know, over, call it decades, but it also evolves like seasonally within the year, right? So like no one talks about Whole30 in September for whatever <laughs> reason, right? Like, and, you know, we, we understood that what our customers are looking for that consistent staple, you know, gourmet dinner that they can have. And, and I think that when we, we started down the route of trying to cater to all of these specific niche diets, we were either finding one, the customer then became like too niche and also too temporary right like we we can service keto we can service whole 30 we can we can service all of those customers they'll have to pick and choose you know what they want look at the ingredient list of course however we didn't want to market ourselves like that because it's not really like it's not what we do again when we think about our customer and we think about a household it's very rare when you have a household with at least two people in it that they're on the same diet. Like it's very, very rare. Maybe in January and like couples that are trying to like get in shape or something, but like outside yeah. of that, that all goes away. And we're, you know, we're thinking about the longer term. So when we think about that, we want to make sure we can cater to as many diets as possible. However, um, you know, there are niche cases where, you know, it, it, the interesting thing too with filtering that you bring up is folks kind of, they really only want to see what's applicable to them. You know, and I think that that's where we can do a much better job. You know, so for example, 
and we don't even have to ask them, right? Like we can see, hey, you've ordered vegetarian clearly the last three or four times you've placed orders. We're going to like prioritize the order in which we show you these items on the menu. You know, that's something we're actively working on. But, you know, we'd rather utilize their order behavior and data. And perhaps we could optimize this on like a upfront survey when we onboard folks. But that's how we think about it. We don't want to, we can nudge and we can suggest um, but we don't want to go down the rabbit hole of, you know, catering to any specific diet and kind of have it seem like a fad that comes and goes. That's great. Yeah, it's great to hear. I think, um, yeah, a lot of these things are very rigid and they're constantly evolving. And I don't, I don't think any labels really apply to anyone these days. I think every, if you look at baskets of gross, you know, in, inside of grocery stores and online grocery services, there's no... It is no, it, it, none of them really make sense without like actually talking to the customer, understanding right. why they chose what they chose. Why did they ch- choose the local eggs and the Doritos and <laughs> with that? And like, you know, they just love what they love. And there's all sorts of factors that go into that. So it makes a lot of sense. Yep. Applying my product man- former product manager slash food tech hat, current food tech hat. This is this seems like a really fun thing to build. There's a lot of components. If I had to do my like, you know, outsider analysis of your your service, you have the customer facing website obviously and the UX there. And then you have and the menus and then you have um, commissary operations and you have logistics and you have supply chain that feed into the the commissary and it seems like there's a lot of in- modules there i guess walk us through like w- you know the build and buy kind of what you've b- decided to build in-house and why that's been so important and kind of how you look at you know the proprietary tech that, that you've built and why that's been so important yeah i think if you know i have a philosophy on this if you can build it build it um and if you don't want to build it like find a way to build it <laughs> uh, like especially if you have aspirations of you know scaling um, because a lot of these modular kind of components, um, certainly can help when you get off the ground and like, don't get me wrong. We, we like, I'll give you a great example. We'll never go build our own like logistics platform because it's not, it's, it's, we can't do it better. Right. <laughs> what we can do is make sure that the integration is super, super tight and aligns with our operation. So when we do work with third party software providers, like I'll give you an example, Optimo route, we use them for our deliveries like there's an extremely tight integration, you know, it's, it's almost like we're at, we're, we're constantly asking them to like make tweaks to their stack to ensure that it like flows much more seamlessly with what we're doing. Um, but when it comes to something fundamental to the product, like kitchen operations, that's completely custom built. And, you know, I, I don't know, I'm kind of old school. So I remember we've gone through, we're still doing these iterations today, but the first iteration of the kitchen operations was an Excel workbook and we would print them out because folks in the kitchen, I'd say to this day, primarily still want to use, you know, paper, especially the cooks, right? Like it's, it's just their preferred method of um, interaction. And, and hopefully we get, we'll get beyond that point, but um, we'll start with like a printout from an Excel workbook and they'll honestly just give us direct feedback and within three to four weeks, you kind of know exactly what you need to build based off of the kind of proof of concept plus the feedback from the cooks. And you kind of just iterate and iterate and iterate. We've been doing that since 2018. And so now we have a completely, you know, customized, pretty complex back end, but it is catered to Feast and Fettles operations, which is, you know, I, I don't know if we ever had to sell the business. It's not really applicable to like hop into another business. Like you would have to fundamentally change the way you do, you know, our ops, but it's very, very good for us because, um, you know, it's, it's built off of direct feedback from how we deliver our product from the folks who are putting in the work, um, to actually deliver that product. So huge proponent of building a house. Um, what we outsource is, or what we have third party software is, is logistics. Um, we do a little bit with, um, uh, sourcing, which is anyone wants to start a billion dollar business. Can you figure out like how to get all of the big wholesale, uh, producers to, to get on a single tech platform? That would be great. Um, <laughs> so we use a system software to help us out there, but, um, everything else is custom built. Amazing. And so with those custom modules you did for the chefs, they're still printing out paper though. At the end of the day, you're just not manually doing it from an Excel workbook, right? 
Yep, so they're all, they're actually custom design exports and outputs. And it depends on where you are in the kitchen, whether you're on the, the hot line, the cold line, fulfillment, um, you'll get different exports. Um, and you know, where we're having discussions about, you know, introducing more kind of tablet-based interactions in the kitchen. And we tried this a couple of years ago, but folks weren't, I don't know, just didn't, didn't click that well. Um, but no, they're asking this time. So we're, we're going to give it another shot. I'd be thinking about like some of the key KPIs or just like things that you notice really improve when you, when you build this, the right tools, you know, I guess like, what are those things, you know, and obviously how do they impact the bottom line? Things like food waste and just like, what are some of the biggest challenges there that you've been able to kind of reduce? Yeah. So we have one, uh, major kind of op operational KPI we call the perfect order score. And essentially what that is, is a score. It's a, it's a order that leaves this kitchen in which we hear nothing from the customer. Maybe, okay, more positive, maybe some positive feedback, but we don't want to hear, hey, delivered to the wrong address. We don't want to hear, oh, um, you know, swap the wrong item, missing item. Um, we don't want to hear that, you know, it didn't reheat that well. We don't want to hear that the flavor profile wasn't on point. So there's different ownership along kind of the product journey that we assign. So if it's product related, i.e., again, you know, reheating instructions were wrong, didn't like the flavor, that's a complaint. If it's um, kind of fulfillment related, like I got the wrong item, I was missing an item, you know, that's a complaint. So what we do is we sum up those complaints divided by the number of the orders every week. We rally around this. I mean, we have a Monday meeting every week and we report the perfect order score. And um, internally, the, the benchmark's 99%. We get there. I mean, I feel like we need to up that because folks are just like, we're just hitting it every week. So it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, the, the bar needs to move a little bit higher. But um the reason why that's important is because, you know, we're building tools that support driving that number higher and higher because we know that's super important, right? We know it's important that folks receive this, receive the product and the service. Everything's on point and we don't hear anything from them and they keep it and they keep ordering. So we will build tools to continue to support that effort with feedback from the folks that are, you know, on the ground doing that every day. It's amazing. Yeah, it's so operationally complex and there's so much that can go wrong. And it's such a, you know, these two industries of like, you know, food service and hospitality mixed with technology have historically just been like oil and water. And, you know, it takes a very interesting, you know, hybrid skill set to really bridge the, those two worlds and deliver that experience of that perfect order. So I can definitely appreciate you know, all the complexities that feed into that, you know, creating that outcome for the, for the customer and how good that must feel when you know you're, you're nailing it because you're just not hearing anything or hearing great things. So yeah. that's, that's very cool. And I'd love to transition a little bit to the kind of one of the biggest challenges, I think, in this industry, which is customer acquisition, which is why a lot of these meal kit services, um, you know, have really fallen in value. If you look at like Blue Apron and um, obviously what we were going to talk later, hopefully about Freshly, but you know, talk to us about how you're able to solve some of those challenges. What, what's some of the biggest um, channels that you use and then maybe talk a little bit about some something very cool that you re recently shared with me which is agile um, yep. I would love to hear more about that yeah so customer acquisition has been been a journey for for myself and the company you know when I joined we didn't you know not we didn't spend a dollar on <laughs> on paid we relied on word of mouth um, you know over like call it the first year and a half to two years that you know I was since I had joined in 2018 um, you know, I, I, I picked up digital marketing. It was, um, I'd say the analytical side of it was, you know, kind of came more naturally, but the, um, you know, the, the content creation and optimization and, you know, targeted audiences and understanding exactly how to, you know, understand the nuances between all of the different channels, where should you, you know, deploy your capital. That became um, something I owned actually up until earlier this year because I was so afraid to hand that off because there's so much like deep work that had, you know, gone into that. Um, we've made the transition, like I said, from pure analog to pure digital. Um, and I'd say about a year ago, we started to actually dial back a little bit on the pure digital approach. 
and the pure digital approach was actually kind of accelerated with COVID, right? So like, there was kind of like the only approach, right? Like you're not gonna go buy a billboard if, <laughs> if no one's out on the road. Um, but you know, tr the strategies change, um, but the important thing with paid is that, you know, if you, if, you know, click, go to a, a meal delivery's website and then look at your, your Facebook or Instagram feed after that. And it's just like flooded with, I don't know if the same agency is like doing all of the ads for all, for all of these, for all of the companies, but it's like the same hue of green. It's like a price point with like a line through it. And then it's kind of like a corny like scene of someone microwaving something that doesn't even look like good. Um, and we understood that it's not like what you buy. It, people don't buy your product because of the what. They, they will actually, it's like the why. It's the emotion. It's the feeling. Like, what are you giving them? You know, great. You're selling them food and that's awesome. But like, talk to them about the, what they get back in exchange. Like for us, we know that, you know, we hear this all the time from our members, which is, hey, we actually put our kid to bed. We feed them whatever kids eat. And then we enjoy, we enjoy peace and fettle together as a couple. And you have given us like more time together as a couple. Now, to me, that is like, that's the content, right? Like that's the content you create. That is the story you tell versus like just throwing a plate, you know, on a <laughs> heat and like, you know, there's yeah. more to it than that. Yeah. Um, so we've always, we've always led with organic and we use organic as, as the cue to tell us what type of content are people reacting to. Mm. You know, on our free channels and then we optimize those on the paid channels um you know as we as we've kind of um expanded and we've gotten more granular and it gets super super technical um mm. you know obviously post ios has gotten super hard to you know track but you know it's always been hard to really track so it hasn't really changed that much for us and then is there anything you can share about the billboards and agile or sorry not the billboards the the trucks with agile yeah, Agile's um, been pretty awesome to work with. We uh, we have some hardware, um, and it's actually not installed by Agile. Agile, let me just take a step back. Agile's kind of markets themselves as like a real estate company, a mobile real estate company. So they might have a truck truck for call it Anheuser Anheuser Busch, and that truck could get branded with I don't know Doritos. So Doritos then becomes the advertiser um, on that particular asset. And as that asset is, um, you know, doing its route, um, Agile is tracking kind of mobile device IDs within the proximity of that particular asset. So um, once I learned about that, I said, hey, you know, we have 30 delivery vans that are on the road five days a week. Maybe we can utilize the same technology. So um, partnered up with Agile still early on in the partnership, um, but what we're essentially doing is utilizing our existing fleet. We're using the hardware that's already installed in our vans for safety. We use a tool um, called Samsara. And essentially we were able to tie in directly and essentially track the mobile device IDs that um, are uh, within proximity of our vans. And without it sounding too creepy, we can you know, essentially do some very unique content remarketing around that. So you can basically hit those devices up presumably on Instagram or some sort of paid channel. Correct. Yep. Wow. And I'm also assuming that there's just like an inherent organic virality of people just seeing your vans once you hit a certain concentration of a new market, right? Yeah. And that's, that's actually a super important point about um, what we do. You know, we don't have a super high CAC because, especially for our LTV, but, you know, we have our physical, we have physical billboards driving around um, you know, again, around the neighborhoods that we, that we were delivering already five days a week. And we weren't really able to measure that historically in a consistent way. And with agile, we're starting to kind of move down that path of saying, Hey, what is the actual benefit? Mm -hmm. Um, but we do know, we know like saturation in a particular zip code or neighborhood is super, super important. Um, and so we have very concerted efforts with our, from our marketing team to, mm -hmm. You know, we might be in all of Massachusetts, but we're not spend we're not like evenly spreading that money. You know, we're we're mm -hmm. we're strategically concentrated around those neighborhoods that um, you know will have the highest ROI for us. Very cool, uh, fascinating what what you can do these days. Technology is pretty pretty insane. Um, yeah. Love to talk about. Um, 
kind of the B2B side of your business, right? And how does that complement the consumer offering? I'm, I'm seeing lately you've been announcing that you, you're doing some sort of a partnership with, with uh, corporate offices like CVS or Bridgewater or other kind of local corporates. Um, you know, when did that start and how's that business grown and how does that kind of fit into what you're doing? And, and I guess from a from an economic standpoint of as far as like leveraging those, those economies of scale. Yeah, so it's it's something I'd say more recently we've we've began to focus on. Historically, we've done it on an ad hoc basis when folks have reached out to us to, to, to request hey, would you guys be interested in a corporate partnership? Uh, but now there's more of a concerted effort, and you know we're looking to partner with organizations. Again, your members, your customers will tell you everything. So you know where your customers already work, where they already spend their time, like those are the those are the corporate partners you should go after. You know we don't do a lot of, I mean yeah we'll have hypotheses, but like a lot of the times if you just kind of listen to where the customers um, tell you, you know you know they they kind of plant the they plant the seeds and you can kind of go figure it out. So we've, we've had a little more of a concerted effort, actually, let's say Q4 of last year, moving into this year. So we've had some partnerships with CVS, Bridgewater, um, Harvard Medical. Um, and these are places where, again, our, our members already work. Um, there's just an ongoing discount that's unique to um, each uh, corporation. And, you know, the, the thing that we're trying to change and the thing we're working on is really blowing out that relationship a little bit more. So, you know, can we partner with them on specific events or um, any type of like health initiatives that they have internally that we can work alongside with them on? So it's still early stages, um, something that's exciting. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's again, it's just, it's something where our customers kind of sent the signal. So we started to focus a bit more. It sounds like the customers still have to pay out of their own pocket for it. It's not, it's not being subsidized by their employer. We actually had a couple of corporations that were doing that during COVID specifically. Um, I mean, maybe it's the macro <laughs> macroeconomic environment that's shifting things, but it doesn't seem like as many corporations are uh, doing that nowadays. But I wouldn't be surprised if you know we come across a company that subsidizes that for their employees. Makes them more productive, no no sluggishness uh, in the in the afternoon, eating clean, feeling healthy, feeling good, more productive. Or lower health premiums too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, would love to talk about kind of you know something that I found very interesting with you guys is that you're you're starting to test a brick and mortar location, which I I found really fascinating. Um, we we've seen examples of this in the marketplace, like. Foxtrot, which is based in Chicago. For those who don't know, it's kind of like a modern day, you know, bodega convenience store centered around coffee and fresh prepared food and these like kind of meal solutions that are grab and go kind of for urbanites, uh, I would say upward, you know, upwardly mobile urbanites. Um, and that business is, you know, I think about half delivery, half pickup historically. And so I'm curious how you, you're thinking about the brick and mortar what those stores are going to be designed to look like, how they're going to function, where do they fit in with the de within the delivery infrastructure? Does that help you s use them as spokes? You know, I got a, a ton of questions with that, but I'm just kind of curious, like, what was the impetus for this, and how do you envision that test going? Yeah, we've uh, it's something we've talked about when, even when we were really, really small. Like, when we had 50 customers, we were like, hey, like, we should think about retail. <laughs> um, I, I'd say it, it's a it's a... From a timing perspective, it makes a lot of sense for the business. I, I think that's important to just note. Like we didn't just jump into this as like a opportunistic kind of endeavor. We really think there's like a, a true opportunity here. Um, and you know how how we're actually going to leverage our existing infrastructure and technology to me is like one of the most important kind of components of this. So we have you know all of this infrastructure built out. We have the technology, we have the, the logistics, we have you know everything built out. Um, the one thing we actually did have to build for this, and again, you're probably gonna think I'm crazy, but we built out like our custom POS. We didn't wanna like layer it on. <laughs> Not another POS system, yeah. come on. <laughs> no, we didn't wanna tie into like the toasts of the world because you know, like we always think about our members. So I'll get back to like why we did the POS, but um, you know, from an experiential standpoint, you know, we want our customers to, we want our customers to be able to get our food as most conveniently as possible without us becoming a company that just is burning cash for the sake of getting another customer. 
And what I mean by that is we all know delivery is not like the, the delivery, the delivery model as it's kind of been operating over the past 10 years, most companies are just burning cash on every single order as they scale. It's just, you're just burning more cash as you scale. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And, and you started to see a transition in that, right? So like great example, I ordered from my favorite Chinese restaurant here in Providence a week ago and the, the bill was $65 on DoorDash and I, they actually attached the receipt for the food oh my on God. the paper bag and it was like $39. And I was like, how does it get from 30? Like, where's the gap there? Um, so anyways, we're gonna run a profitable model. We have a profitable delivery model and now we wanna run a profitable retail model. And so the way we're gonna run the profitable retail model is utilize the tech, the infrastructure, the operations, our menu changes every week, so we're going to be able to change the menu in the retail location every single week, which I think is also super unique um, as a concept. Um, but the thing that we're going to layer on in there is the experience of, you know, the Feast and Fettle brand, which is primarily, or it's all digital today. So now you're going to be able to go and kind of see, touch, feel, um, which is super, super important. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're going in optimistically. Um, with our first location in our kind of where the business started on the east side of Providence and uh, looking to open a second and third in the next six to nine months. Amazing. Wow. So, and can I break, break, like, is there going to be any dine in? How do you envision people using it? If they're, they're not, they don't have to be subscribed. Um, It sounds like they can just literally grab and go and kind of pay for it. Yeah. So imagine you walk in, um, pretty simple kind of flow. You have your entrees, your sides, you'll have these kind of on the go type of items. So mm-hmm. the single serve uh, salads with proteins, you'll have parfaits. Again, all of this, all of this is literally, again, made fresh and delivered to that store. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, I think it's very unique because the menu will change every single week. Um, uh, the cool thing about it is we, because we built the custom POS, we'll be able to offer you know, rewards, you can redeem your rewards as a member that you got in the core business in store. Um, there's a lot of cool little additional benefits that members will get simply because we've kind of owned the infrastructure from a technology standpoint. Um, so we're, exci- you know, we're super, super excited. You're going to be able to get like the local partners that we have on our menus, like seven stars bread. If you're in Rhode Island, you'll know what that is. Um, mm. But essentially, utilizing the local partnerships plus core of what we do, but just in a retail setting um, in a way that's super, super convenient. Um, Super small like seating. So we'll have like stools with a little like, you know, up against the window, but the goal is really similar goal, right? Just completely different audience, right? You might, you might've forgot to order Feast and Fettle. You might've not placed your order by the deadline. However, you know, you can still go to the retail location. And and also we, we expect this to, you know, introduce the brand to a lot of folks that haven't, haven't tried the service. So many, yeah, it's amazing. Like how, yeah, how, how many different boxes you can check with retail and how much more convenience you're adding by doing that. It's, um, everyone thinks dark stores, dark stores is convenient, but you know, what about just a simple retail presence, you know, in, in a strip mall or somewhere with cheap rent that doesn't have a hood, you know, because you have a commissary, you can spoke it. You know, it's exactly. very, very smart. Um, it kind of reminds me of Proper Foods, which is, I think they're in New York and I've seen them in San Francisco. Um, they're just kind of doing grab and go, um, kind of hub and spoke, I think. Um, uh, kind of as we come up on the conversation, I, I would love to talk about the future of where you think, you know, regional meal prep services around the country evolve you know do you see this as being something that is kind of like a cottage industry where you have a bunch of little mom and pops or do you think it fragment uh, it, it becomes consolidated you know where where do you think like the other feasts and fettles across the country where do you think this all kind of nets out over time yeah i, I think like first and foremost there's a massive opportunity if you're focused on a even a small regional air er, like area, I think like there's this notion again, probably driven by like the tech world, where you know to become a hundred million dollar business, you need to like go you know down the whole East Coast or you need to go national. Like that is not true. Um, so if you have a customer base and you can focus on them, um, I think that's that's the key to success. There, I mean, like think about it today. Like there is no even McDonald's who like dominates like you know. <laughs> The takeaway, mo- the takeaway market, right? Like they, they dominate the market, but like it's still, you still have so many other options. And I think the same will apply to, 
you know, the feast and fettles of the world and the more convenient options, they'll serve as different segments of the market. You know, us in particular, we obviously have big aspirations as a company, um, but we don't lose focus of the importance of what's important to our customer. So great example, like, we service an affluent customer base that cares that the food is prepared locally and prepared by real chefs and it's not, you know, manufactured food. So, you know, I can't just say, hey, you know, let's let's seal these up, let's freeze them and ship them to <laughs> Mississippi. Like that's not the value prop. So, you know, it's 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 a matter of knowing who your customer is. And look, like don't get me wrong, like there is there is going to be a like I'll call it the low cost provider that just wins the game and Maybe I, I initially kind of thought that was like freshly given the Nestle mm. acquisition. They, with it, they definitely at least had the capital. They probably just made a decision wasn't working. But um, yeah, there's just different segments of the market. So it's okay to have multiple winners. Um, I hope there's another Feast and Fettel either down in Florida or on the West Coast. And, you know, it's healthy competition or, um, you know, I, 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 I could easily see some consolidation down the line too, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how things kind of shake out. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you're curious to get a firsthand look at the cutting edge of food and tech, check out Hungry.tv. That's Hungry with No You, where you can join in on live conversations like these or sign up for the free weekly newsletter.